Uh, let us begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, Creator, I ask your blessings upon us tonight as, as part of your creation. That you gave us the gift of knowing you, to be able to relate to you, to be made in your image and likeness. I ask you to bless all of us today as we gather to learn about your creation and original sin, the way the beauty and then the, the marring of that beauty of the universe. So I ask you to be with us tonight and the Holy Spirit to guide us and to inspire us and to inform us and to lead us. And I ask these things through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So tonight what I'd like to do is, uh, I, might be, I might be a little bit shorter than usual because I need to talk to the real RCIA people uh, maybe a little longer than usual down in the treat room, down at the uh, far end of the campus. So later we'll go there. But today what I want to talk about, the first part, is creation. The Catholic theology of creation, and then I'll finish with the Catholic theology of original sin. And so they kind of go together here, but it really sets us up, you know, we've already talked about who we are as, as a person uh, being uh, open and uh, c capable of, of interacting with God. We have talked about how God reveals himself to us and how that looks like. And then we've talked about part of that revelation in scripture of the, the written tradition that is, that is interwoven with uh, the, the oral tradition, the lived experience of the church, and then that teaching power that guided by the Holy Spirit, the, the teaching church, the magisterium. Tonight, I want to just talk about what, what is the world like? What, in the Catholic understanding, what's happened and who are we? Not really necessarily, in, in, it's not really Christian anthropology of who the person is, although we'll get there just a little bit, but really, what's the universe like? Um, I'm not going to, this is not a scientific presentation talking about, um, it's more of a metaphysical, theological presentation. I'm not going to get into any of the sciences. I'm going to talk about something that goes down below the sciences. And as far as a foundational thing of, of, of you know, yes, you know, the matter is matter and it works the way it works, but how is it organized? What's its principle? How does it begin? Where is it going? So and I was telling people before class started, this is just my writing. Um, if you can't read it, um, just ignore it. But I want to talk about creation in terms of uh, there's lots of ideas out there, lots of metaphysical ideas out there of, of what's it like, what's going on here. Some of them I put up here just to sort of say this is not what the Catholic Church teaches and then just talk about what the Catholic Church does teach. First of all, there are some uh, throughout history, philosophy and the other cultures and these sort of things who have said, they didn't, may not use the word or the, the phrase pantheism, but pantheism just comes from Greek words meaning all is God. Everything's God. And this is the idea. I don't know if, uh, I never actually saw this movie, but, um, oh, now it, it's escaped me. Avatar. Anybody see Avatar? Anybody see, guys see that movie? My understanding was that Avatar is that this, the, whole, the whole world is alive. Isn't that true? That, that, that the planet it has some sense of being alive. Now, I must deny that the Catholic Church said, yes, there are, there are interacting biological systems interact with the material world, and so it's a hugely complex reality of a planet with life on it, like Earth. But the idea that it, the matter is God and God is matter, that's not a Catholic understanding. Um, it is true that we would say God does sustain the world. This is the philosophical distinction, though, between being the foundation of being and being being itself. God is, you know, we're not all just God working. Uh, God is separate from the universe. That's a big, you know, again, that would be a big distinction among some other belief systems. Uh, not all, certainly, but some. And so there, there's, there's ways in which, you know, some scripture passages and other things sort of may lend themselves into some of this idea, but that's not the theology of the church. Now, God is separate from the universe. The universe and God are not the same thing. The other thing is, uh, there, are, there have been religions, there are religions and philosophies that are, there are dualistic. And the dualistic uh, idea of metaphysics is that the, the world is good versus evil. There's, a, there's this equal battle going on. And there, and there are tendencies also in Christianity that could lead in this direction. Where there, is, there is language of war between God and the devil or things like this. 
But in the Christian understanding, you're talking about apples and oranges. You're not talking about two equal understandings, two equal powers. Because what the dualists can try to explain by the, the idea that saying all is a war between good and evil. It, it accounts for con, you know, conflict, it, it accounts for destruction, it accounts for all those sort of things by, by that philosophy. So the, none of these are, are stupid in the sense that they're, they're uh, ridiculous. There's always a reason why that one particular aspect of experience is brought out and underlined. But for Christianity, and here I don't think, you know, classic Protestantism and Greek Orthodox would say the same thing, that God and the devil are not the same thing. We'll talk about the devil later when we talk about angels and things. But the devil, we're going to talk a little bit about the original sin. That's created realities. God created all the angels, including the devil. It's, it's, God has as much control over them as he does over us. In the sense of, you're not talking about two equal forces. You're talking about God and then some of his creatures who have deliberately gone against God's will. Again, we'll talk about that later. But we see the universe as not dualistic. We do not believe there's a dualism involved. Cyclical. There are also aspects of philosophies and theologies in the world and in history that think of that all is great cycle. That it's not time per se, it's all birth and rebirth, it's just one continuous circle. And you can, you can see this in, in, in some Eastern religions, the idea. You can also see it, in, you know, even there are scientific sort of analogies here, which, you know, this idea of if there's a Big Bang, then, the, you know, bringing it all back together again and exploding, sort of this pulsating reality that takes billions of years. And again, you could think of those terms. Um, and there are cyclical elements in the church's experience. You know, we have a liturgical year. Uh, there, there's this, there is this idea of birth, death, and rebirth in you know, human history, not individual lives in the same sense as reincarnation or something, but this certainly Christianity recognizes a cyclical element to life. Uh, but we would still say reality is not itself cyclical. Um, there's a, in fact, what you're, you talk about here is one of the unique uh, aspects of Judaism and Christianity. So Judaism would agree with everything I've said so far, by the way. Um, that it's linear. There's a beginning, and it's going towards an end. Reality has this beginning, as we know it. Um, the universe, time and matter, energy, all those things, have a beginning, and they're going towards an end. So in that sense, linear. Although there's these epicycles in the linear. You know, the worlds go around, cycles do, you know, repeat themselves, but it's all going in a direction. So again, that would be a distinction between Christianity and some other ideas. Materialism, very, very popular modern philosophy of, of metaphysics, although it's a metaphysics without metaphysics. It would, say, it would be a metaphysics that denies metaphysics, which means simply that it's a physics, you're saying all is matter. Um, there is no such thing as spiritual, you know, there's no spiritual, there's no non-material, that's a contradiction. Non-material being is a contradiction in terms. There is no such thing. And there is, no, there is no underlying purpose or mind involved in the universe. It's somehow, it's just simply, um, it's matter and energy, and these are, these are interchangeable, and they just, they interact according to laws. That's what reality is. Um, and certainly, the Catholic Church would say, this, the material world is explained, you know, it, it's true, these, these physical forces and, and energies, they do interact according to laws. But we also say, but it's not all there is. Um, that there is, there is mind involved in here. There is spirit involved in, in reality. And so, um, though that again is a very popular modern idea. That, you know, it's just, it's just all matter. Um, and, the, in, 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 and meaning is illusory. It's something that our own minds have put into uh, the physical universe. Then you'll know, get the old question, okay, where's our mind come from? And the nano, you know, the, the neurological uh, uh, explorations and scientific uh, ideas of that, well, 
it can all be explained by just the way in which matter and energy is, is interacting in this particular piece of matter, which is called, is called the brain. Um, that that's, you know, the whole idea of mind is itself illusory. Um, that there's not a mind per se, it's simply, again, it's chemicals and it's matter and it's energy, it's, they, they, they interact in certain ways, very, 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 very complex ways, but you could still explain it all in, in material terms. So those, I, I wrote down, those are some of the, what I would call, uh, visions of creation. So you see, I'm not saying, okay, here's geology and here's physics and stuff. I'm saying, what's the big picture like? What do we think, how do we conceive of the universe? And so what, what we would say, so these are some of the things that we would say are, are not true, and there are probably some others that I didn't put up there, and maybe you'll um, throw them out at me at the, the question time. But what, what we would say is that there is definitely a beginning that if we only ask how and why did God create? Um, and I would start, and I, I, I meant to, to go to uh, Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of read this very briefly. I'm not going to go through the whole s seven days. You know, that would take a long time. But I just want to re remind you of the flavor of how the Bible begins. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was a formless wasteland, and darkness covered the abyss, while a mighty wind swept over the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw how good the light was. God then separated light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Thus evening came, and the morning followed the first day. And then, you know, you know I, I suspect the stories of the first chapter of Genesis, just the way in which this creation is, is laid out. And I would just say that... The, Genesis is not philosophy or science. It's not, it, it's not meant to be that. Uh, this this, this was, was expressed and written down for people who were pre-scientific and pre-philosophical, actually. Uh, but it was meant to explain in the terms that they could understand what the reality was, which were a few principles would be that reality is good, and it's made out of nothing. There is a, there's a beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so the, the classical term is ex nihilo, a Latin term meaning out of nothing. Um, you know, all, everything we make is coming from stuff. All we can do is recreate. We can't create in some sort of pure sense. Um, we can take matter and energy and reformulate it, but we can't create it. There's something about conservation of energy, as I recall my high school physics class, that you can, you can play with it all you want. Well, you can, you can play with it, um, we wish we could play it all we want, but we can't yet. Um, who knows? Maybe someday we will. But the fact of the matter is, we can't, you know, we, again, we just reshape. And what we're saying is, no, God actually, it, it, the little kid down at Monday night faith formation class is always saying, well, if God created, who created God? You know, if God was the beginning, what was before God? Um, good questions. I mean, trying to get this idea of, bef of a before what does that even mean? But before time, if you're outside of time, this whole idea is, 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 a, is a mind bender. But we'd say there's a beginning. He's creating out of nothing. Many of the mythologies don't go there. Many of the, the Greek or the Norse or some of the other mythologies, there's stuff already there when the mythology starts up. There's not an explanation of how did the stuff get there to begin with. And there's, uh, kind of the church is not saying there's an explanation in scientific terms about this happening. We're not glued to the Big Bang Theory, whatever that, you know, however that science might have. This is, again, not a scientific explanation. It's metaphysics. But we'd also say God created a good universe. And so, again, Genesis chapter 1. Now, we're going to get to Genesis chapter 3 by the end of the night, and then we're going to talk about the original sin and what that means. But it begins good. God's intentions are always good. And this is going against the, for instance, a, a Platonistic, you remember Plato, the great, probably the greatest Greek philosopher. Some would say the greatest philosopher of all time. Um, everything else is just a commentary on Plato. Western philosophy, everything after Plato was simply a commentary on Plato. Either you disagreed with him or you agreed with him, but he, he set the questions and he set the tone. Plato said, no, the whole point is to get rid of, of this matter. Matter is bad and we're going to go spiritual. And there's, again, there are tendencies and movements within Christianity that have been that sort of anti-matter, saying that uh, 
it's very kind of dualistic in the sense of matter is evil, spiritual is good. That's very platonic. And that's not Christian, though. It, there can, it can be a mistake Christians make saying, oh, this bad body, you know, whether you're talking about, oh, sexuality is bad or food is bad or beauty is bad or whatever it is. Again, that's a misunderstanding of Christianity. Christianity says, no, the universe is good because God created it and God is good. God is the good. So, again, that's an understanding of, of a, a, a Catholic understanding. Here's a little distinction. Now, I'm talking flavoring, not absolute. Because, again, sometimes it's also on a popular level, not upon a strict theological level. But I was, uh, we were going to a birthday party for Father Steve this week. And somehow, the talk ended up on parties the Holy Family staff have. Um, and there was talk about someone who had run into another staff member from the Methodist Church and had described a party that we were going to have and said that there was going to be wine present. And the Methodist said, oh yeah, you Catholics. Um, you get to have wine at your parties, don't you? Um, with both a hint of you know, condescension, but also envy, I suspect. The, this idea, there's just a little bit, just a little bit of, you know, some Christians think Catholics drink too much, party too much, feast too much. Um, and, you know, the, the Puritan understanding is this could be a bad thing. The world could be a bad thing. It's not, in Catholic, we, we certainly fast, but we also feast. We, we recognize the universe is good. Again, I've already said, God sustains the world. We say, God did not need the world, so it's not like God created out of necessity. There's nothing forced about this. God lacks nothing. It's not like, oh, I'm lonely, I need a world, or, oh, boy, I need a challenge, I'm going to create a universe. Um, there's nothing like that sense. There's a mystery here. Why would God create? When we talk about the Trinity, we might go there. We might say, okay, here's, here's a nice set of ideas of why, perhaps, we don't know, why did God create anyway? There's absolutely no need for him to do that. And yet he does. And he sustains the world. So he's not the, the watchmaker God. This is the old classic. I, this, is, this would be deism. Deism, put that as number five. Deism would be the classical uh, enlightenment theology. Remember, the, the, it said, let's say Age of Enlightenment, 1700s. Think of Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, you know, uh, Voltaire, those kind of types. They might believe that there's a God, uh, uh, you know, an unmoved mover, a first principle, someone who would start off. But he, he, God would start it off and then disappear. And so, you know, I'm going to start this off as a, as a, as a, a little, little truffle. How does things start? So there, there's this idea that God is out there starting it up, but he's not you know, with you and me. He's not sustaining us. He's not involved or caring about us. This is Aristotle's God. God is there, but God doesn't care. Um, and we would say, no, God sustains every single one of us at all times. We, the energy and matter, without God, it doesn't exist. He brought into being, he sustains it in being. Now, he works according to these laws that he, he, that he himself set up in his own mind, and yet, um, without God, nothing exists. Uh, not just at the beginning, but always. And, but we would all say, he created a world that is not completed. It is in the, in the Latin phrase, in statu via, in the state of journey. And so the creation is an ongoing, not completed reality. Remember I talked about the linear understanding of creation. There is a beginning and there's an end, and there's, there's journey. Now, what we call this progress because, again, there, a, a modern tendency and theme in all sorts of, of areas of human endeavor is progress. The idea that we're getting better, smarter, more moral, better, just, we're, it's just getting better and better, a little better every day. Um, this idea of where, you know, so there's a, there is a secular equivalent of Christianity in an idea of a progression of human beings into something down here, which is, you know, marvelous. Um, and so that idea is something that we could share with, you know, at least in the, in the, the broad sense of 
we don't necessarily think we're going the same way for the same reason, but it's not ancient Egypt or something like this, where you had thousands of years of static society where we're saying, it was this way yesterday, it's this way today, it'll be this way tomorrow. This is just the way it is. We're not going anywhere, we're just going. And it tends to be more the cyclical, just saying, this is just this is the way it is. And we're saying, no, God is, is this creation is unfolding towards an end. So, again, the, we have this beautiful beginning of, of, in, in the book of, the, of Genesis, and there's an end in the book of Revelation. So there's a plot to the Bible. There's a plot to God's revelation. He's saying, hey, let me tell you the roadmap of reality for you. Here's what, here's what history is, here's what humanity is, and here's where we're going. So questions about any of that? There's questions about some of that so far. You know, the whole creation idea. These are, that's simple snapshots in 20 minutes of huge swaths of Western theology and philosophy. But it's, it's how we look at the universe and as opposed to some other uh, schools of thought throughout history and today. Questions or comments or... No? No? Okay, so what we're going to go now is the next plot, the next plot device is, in fact, original sin. So what I want to talk about now is, so the plot thickens in chapter 3 of Genesis. So chapter one, everything's pretty good. Chapter two, second creation story, we might get to that when we talk more about human person, but all is good. God looked at, saw it, and it was good. And when he made us, human being, it was very good. Remember on that sixth day? Boy, created Adam in, in oh, beautiful. Original sin. And then he blew it. So this is in Genesis 3. I'm not going to read the whole story because I think most of you probably know um, the, the basic outlines of Genesis 3 and the fall of Adam and Eve. You've got the old devil there and the snake. Now, again, these, these are, um, these are uh, theological interpretations of the revelation of Scripture. And, and this is being written for people of, of, of the of a, uh, Mesopotamian uh, sort of Semitic culture, roughly 1000 BC. Uh, and so you're, you're dealing with that kind of presentation. But I want to begin with a little bit of Christian anthropology. So now we're going to talk about who are human beings. Now this isn't the anthropology you would necessarily find in the anthropology department at the University of Washington, but it is, it is looking at the same thing, which is the human being. So how does, the, how does, the, how does our faith view me and you, the human person? And here we leave it to doctors to figure out, okay, how does this body work? You know, it's fine. You know, all those medical schools, all the research that's going on, somebody just got a, some person's got some Nobel Prizes for doing some great work in, in, in uh, you know, biology and in physiology and in medicine. That's great. So we're learning more and more about how the material person uh, of the body works. This, is, this body of ours, we say there's a, a physical principle that uh, there's an integrity to us, a physical integrity and principle to us, that, that we do have bodies. So again, notice the danger of dualism here. There's, there's going to be a, a, a danger of a, a simplistic theology of body, soul being these two completely separate things, and um, the body is bad and the spiritual is good. That's Plato. It's not Christ. But it's, it's, it's language we often use, and in fact, when Paul talks about the spirit warring against the flesh and these sorts of things, um, it lends itself to those understandings. But the body's not bad. This flesh is bad, but then we're, that's because we're going to talk about original sin. The body itself is, is, is beautiful because it's made by God. The Pauline flesh is the body plus original sin, and that's a car wreck. So we're going to get to there. That's, that's where we're headed. So we have this body made by, in, by God, and we also have a soul. Now, this is the unique spiritual principle within each person that is created directly by God and is immortal. So when we talk about the soul, it's, it's true, so we got the body, we got the soul, it's true that these can be separated, but they can't be 
separated well. By that I mean, when we talk about the, the end of the linear times, when we talk about life and death, death is a separation of these two. This is not a healthy thing, this is a bad thing. When the body and soul are separate, this is seen as seen, these, these integrities are violated. And harmony and restoration means the body and soul come together. You can't have a full person without those. When we talk about the resurrection of the body, we're talking about the original totality of the person being restored after death, which is a separation of this spiritual integrity and principle in the body. And the soul is the source of human dignity in that it most clearly reflects the divine image. So we're made in the image and likeness of God. Again, that's Genesis 1. And so what does this, you know, what, is, what can this mean? It means that, um, you know, the, and I talk about this a little bit later again in the morality section, but we have reason. We have a moral sense. Uh, we have these things that are faint echoes of what the divine is. Um, the God is, is mind. You know, God is this, this sense of knowledge. The God in those is omniscient. And, and God is the good. He doesn't not only just know good, he's the good. And yet we can participate in that way, in, 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 with that reality, uh, in some limited ways, which, again, we're made in the image and likeness of God, and there's an original harmony. So we talk about original sin, but before we get there, there's an original har harmony. There is the sense of, there's a way we're supposed to be. Now we're not, but there, 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 is, there is an original way in which we were. Now, when I talk about all of this stuff in the book of Genesis, again, I'm not talking science, I'm not talking, it's, it's not meant to be a textbook in that way. When I talked last week about Revelation and Scripture and how Catholics understand Scripture, there's a broad spectrum of how a Catholic can approach Genesis 1 through 3. Um, you can do it literally and say, this is just the description of what happened, you can also say, no, it's, 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 a, it's a description using ways in which you know, 1000 BC uh, Western Semitic peoples might understand what God, God wanted to get across, some basic principles, and this is the, these are the ways he described it. But it's, we are talking about realities nonetheless. There's this sense of a fall. So when we talk about Eden, when we talk about that paradise, we mean something by it. It's not... Oh, even when I say it's not, not pure myth, um, the tricky thing is, for theologians, myth isn't necessarily bad. It doesn't necessarily mean it's not true. Um, but, I, but that's what you think about when I say myth, so I usually try to avoid that language. But I do mean it says, it's describing some, in some sense reality. Now, how, what, how does that describe in terms of history? I'm a history major. I don't know. I don't know. Can't pin it, can't pin it down. Um, I don't know how that works. But I do feel it's, it, the idea of the original harmony is, is talking about something real. It's not just something that we're making up to try to explain our experience now. We're still talking about something real. In the human, in the human past, there was a, a harmony there that's been lost somehow. And yet there are echoes of it. And, and, and there are senses of it. And so that's when we're going to talk about the, the uh, original harmony turning in, in the original sin. Genesis 3, uh, verses 1 through 13 describes this. Uh, and basically what we're talking about here is the truth expressed is that at the beginning of human history, an event transpired in which a freely chosen fault was committed that's marked all human history, which is a lessening from what we once were, and an alienation from God somehow. Now, Again, I'm just going to say it again. At the beginning of human history, so when's that? I don't know. It's the, human, it's the beginning. But is it, so you're saying I made it up. No, I'm not making it up. But so you're not being very ex explicit here, Father. I know. Um, too bad. At the beginning of human history, an event transpired. So what was it? Did he eat the apple? I don't know. I'm not sure. So was it an apple or a pear? I don't know. Was it even, was, it, was there a tree? Uh, an event transpired in which a freely chosen fault. What was the fault? So, well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not completely sure. Boy, you're getting pretty vague, I know, but it's still true. Was committed that has marked all human history. You, you, don't, you don't become human without this thing happening. 
Now we're talking about Mary and, and Jesus and, you know, when we get to that. But this is the human ex- condition now. That, that we have, that's when we talk about the fall. And it affects everybody. You know, that seems really unfair to us. I say, because we're thinking, what about the individual? You know, yeah, sure, Adam, and maybe Eve, those two, they should really get put in the, in the ringer. But me, I haven't done anything. Why don't I get that original harmony? I, will, I want harmony. Come on. And it's kind of like this football team. You know, you get a penalty. That every, everybody goes back 15 yards. Um, this is a, this, there, there is some sense in which there is an, an, an acting out of these first human beings that has, that they, they were acting for us, for all of us. Now again, if you want to, if you want to s- describe this in literal terms from Genesis 1 and 3, you can't. That's certainly acceptable within Christian, uh, with Catholic theology. If you want to take it in a more, you know, okay, representational way, you can do that too. Um, that is also acceptable with Catholic theology. But the fact of the matter of a fall, that is Catholic theology. It's not simply men. There's something's happened to us. So, and, 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 it's, it's, and I'm going to talk about that, and I'm going to talk around that as we go on. What was it? Uh, again, not, no definite answer, really. There's theories. There's theories. Um, where's Lincoln's, yeah. and I, but I don't want to go there, because none of them are, are the actual teaching of the church. But somehow it's related to disobedience of God's law in a desire to be God-like. There's, a, you know, there's this tree, and, and the devil, in the terms of that snake, is trying to lure the human beings into choosing against something fundamental that God said, don't go there. Because, and there's something to do with immortality. There's something to be like God. Somehow we, we we're seeking to be like God. And the devil's trying to explain God as our enemy. And there's a jealousy between God and us. And so there is a, a distrust and a disobedience to something that God asks of us. And again, so I, I, the, the, I don't know the details, but I do know the basic shape is a pride that makes us want to be God. I mean, that's, that's what it really comes down to. Um, and, and we're not which is a problem. And so it results in an alienation from God that has been chosen by us until it's restored by Jesus in the redemption. So here's the plot again. Remember the Bible is a story. Now it's also an 11-century long collection library of different texts in different languages written by different people in different cultures. And I could break that down in a religious studies department and it could all just be, I could leave it like pieces on a a car you take apart in a garage. And you look at each piece and say, well, that's a screw, or that's a bolt, or that's a cylinder. But there is a purpose to this whole collection of stories. And we got the beginning of it in chapter 1 of Genesis, where it's like, the harmony of creation, God made it all good. And at the end of time, we have the book of Revelation, when the new Jerusalem comes down as a bride to meet her husband, who is Jesus, the New Jerusalem, there's a restoring, again, remember, there's a romantic story here. It's a story of God loving us, we rejecting him. Remember, it's the classical musical. Boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girls back. Um, you have this original harmony of paradise, which is matrimonial, Adam and Eve in the garden. You have the Lack, the, the rejection and the betrayal of love, not only of Adam and Eve betraying each other, but them both betraying God, their separation, loss of the harmony, death comes in and lost, and it's only can, it can't be restored from within the story. There has to be somebody, because there's this divine thing, violation, and somehow there has to be restoration, and only God can do this, and he sends Christ in. He, first, he prepares a people for Christ in the, the Hebrew, eventually Jewish people. They have their own story, and in that people, he's prepared Jesus Christ, who is true God, true man, who is going to restore the original harmony, which is in Revelation that at the end of time begins the linear story. There's a plot. 
It's not, it's not just a serial of, of endless stories. You know, if you, went, if, you, if you ever watched, you know, Flash Gordon or some of these, you know, I'm dating myself, I, I caught the end of that, these serials where it's just one story after another. There's not actually, you know, nowadays Batman has a plot. When I watched Batman, it was just one, you know, there's just, okay, this week it's the Penguin. Um, but there's never any movement. It's always, and the commissioner's always commissioner, and Batman's always Batman, and Robin's always Robin, and that's just the way it is. Segment after segment and segment. There's no linear development. The Bible says, no, there is. And that's the point of Jesus, is to, to restore this original harmony that's been lost by original sin. So, and that's what our baptism, when we talk about baptism and we talk about um, that new life that maybe some of you are going to be going through, you're going to be baptized into the death of Christ to live again in a new life. What, what original sin does is it, again, it, it starts us outside of, it's, it, it starts us outside of Eden. We are all born outside of harmony. It doesn't mean your little baby is not a good, nice baby. But when your baby is born, when you were born and I was born, we were not in Eden. We were born east of Eden. Um, and there's only one way back through. Christ is the only way, this only door is Christ, to go back into Eden. I'm going to preach this someday. The problem, with modern, the, the, the problem with modern technology today is we're trying to storm Eden ourselves. We're trying to get back to Eden by ourselves. And so we're trying to recreate a deathless, immortal, all-powerful reality of harmony using our own powers, and it's going to be self-destructive. It's going to be a violation of the tree of life just like it was in Genesis 3. Go there. I'll go there some, late, some other time. But it brings death in its, in its, in its wing. And we say, oh, come on, Father, it's always been death. You know, as long as there's been life, there's been death. That's the way it works. Yeah, I mean, if I studied biology. You know, I, I know all about death. Nevertheless, first, if you're talking about an original reality, was there a promise given to us somehow for human beings that we could be immortal? I do believe in immortality now. I mean, I, I, I think that each one of us is going to live forever. Uh, what that's going to look like, that's an open question. But death is not part of God's plan in the sense of he's okay with it. There's, the origin, the, there's going to be a harmony when death's defeated. Somehow, at the end of time, now we don't think in time, we think in billion years. I'm not talking billion years. I'm talking about end of time. There's going to be a time when death itself is defeated, alienation from God and one another is defeated, uh, this whole lack of harmony with creation itself. Romans 8 talks about all creation groaning, waiting redemption. It's not just the human persons. Somehow, creation itself has been thwarted. And we don't seem to think that if you're a materialist, that doesn't make any sense either. Because it's just matter and energy clanging around, according to laws. But in Christian understanding, it says, no, reality itself is going down this road that was not God's original intention. Things have gotten mixed up. Because when we talk about original sin in Genesis 3, remember, there's already a snake in the garden. So original sin is not original sin. When we, and we're going to talk about the angelic spirit and the angelic spiritual world, but somehow there is help in getting to original sin. There is this spiritual reality of evil mind that's working in this life in reality as well. Um, so it's not even just we're messed up, but somehow creation itself is going to be renewed in such a way that there's a harmony that's not there now. What is that going to look like? I don't know. I'm not, is it, are you talking about astrophysical terms? I'm not really talking astrophysics. But I am talking about reality. You're not being very clear, Father. No, I'm not. I know that. And yet, so, we have not only, we're not only dying, we're not only lacking harmony, um, we're not only at odds with one another, as Adam and Eve were, we're not only at odds with the created reality, although we are very much at odds with created reality as human beings, uh, we, we mess it up, we, we, we violate it, we, we're in conflict with it. And there's this disordered inclinations that are within us. Part of the harmony is within me. If you, I want you, I'd love you to read uh, Romans 7. In fact, I think I'm going to read for Romans 7. I think I put it down here. This is Paul. So this is St. Paul. This is after his conversion. He's still a mess. So, 
What I do I do not understand, for I do not do what I want, but I do what I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I concur that the law is good, so now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know the good that does not dwell in me, that is, in my flesh. The willing is ready at hand, but doing the good is not. For I do not do the good I want, but I do the evil I do not want. I mean, that's me all over. I mean, that's every one of us. There's a war going on inside of us. Sometimes I know I'm not supposed to do that. I don't want to do that, but I want to do that. We're going to talk about that when we talk about sin. When we talk about the moral life. Now, I know I'm going fast here, but the, the very idea of those dis, disordered inclinations within us. So the human person, when we talk about Christian anthropology, what we're talking about is somebody's the spiritual and physical are melded, and they are one. To die is to have those separated because they're not supposed to be separated. To be restored in resurrection is to have those finally restored in a new way in which there is no longer a lack of harmony or disordered desires in my body very person. So that's part of it. But there's also this idea that I'm made in the image and likeness of God, and yet I am also flawed. To be human is to be noble, and to be human is to be flawed. It's a both and. There's no human institution, including the Catholic Church, there's no human institution throughout history that is without flaws. We always mess it up, always. And yet, there's nothing human that doesn't have nobility to it. I mean, in Dachau and Auschwitz, there was nobility in the midst of the, the worst imaginable things. You know, there were people dying for one another. There was heroism, there was courage, and there was love, even in the midst of the worst imaginable human situation. That's the human condition, the human anthropology. Many of the images of license God, and yet flawed and helpless. A war going on in, in, in the midst of our members. Now, to kind of conclude this, I want to talk about Reinhold Niebuhr, a uh, great American Protestant theologian of the 20th century. He said this. He was called a neo-Orthodox because he actually believed in original sin. The truth is that as absurd as the classical doctrine of original sin may be, may seem to be at first blush, its prestige as a part of the Christian truth is preserved and perennially reestablished against the attacks of rationalists and simple moralists by its ability to throw light upon complex factors in human behavior, in human behavior which should constantly escape moralists. The, the doctrine of original sin explains the way we are. Not in scientific terms, because that's not the way it's going. But it explains human experience. And so it's easy to try to say, oh, you're talking about a snake and eating an apple, or, you know, what are you talking about? But that's the way we are. Um, that it explains the way we are. Now, Blaise Pascal, who was a brilliant scientist in the 17th uh, century, 1600s, he, not only was, he was literally still, you know, he was a world-class scientist back in the, the beginning of the scientific revolution. Um, but he was also a very fervent Catholic, Blaise Pascal, and he wrote these little short snippets. In one of these snippets, uh, he didn't mean them to be snippets, but he meant them to have a, a whole book full of, um, a book on, on Christianity and the faith. He died before it was, um, it was completed, or even really written, but he had the note cards, so to speak. And so we have the note cards for this book, and so we publish those. And he talks about this, in, in the original sin, in one of them. He says this, The greatness of man is so evident, because again, original harmony, the greatness of man is so evident that it is even proved by his wretchedness. So again, original sin, the animal within. For what in animals is called nature, we call wretchedness in man. By which we recognize that his nature now being like that of animals, yeah, we see that, he has fallen from a better nature which once was his. For who is unhappy at not being a king except a deposed king? Who is unhappy at having only one mouth, and who is not unhappy at having only one eye? There's a sense of which we have a longing to be more than we are. No rock, polar bear, fir tree, uh, salmon is discontent in any way in that sense. They're simply themselves. And yet we have the sense of, I'm not all I can be. 
There's, I'm a longing for something that I can't get to myself. Um, so that's what Blaise Pascal is saying. He says, there's something unnatural about that. You know, if it's natural, I mean, who cares? If I have one mouth because I'm only supposed to have one mouth. I don't care if I only have one mouth. I look stupid with two. Um, and I, but I'm saying, you lose, lose an eye, oh. Remember that football player who lost part of his finger tackling a couple weeks ago? Any of you hear about that? Get this. How many of you did? Come on. How many of you heard about the, the football player that lost part of his finger in a tackle? And he didn't know he lost part of his finger. He kept playing. Dumb. But, you know, imagine losing part of your body. He was tackling somebody, and there's it, it so much force, he ripped off the, the end of his finger. And he just kept on playing. Um, but then the, the next day, these commentators said, would you notice if you lost your finger? Oh, I'd notice. Not just the pain, but I don't want to lose part of my body. You know, I, I'm losing something. I, it's unnatural. There's some sense of that in ourselves. Uh, and that's what we, that's, that's, we, it's not hard proof of original sin, but it's, it's suggestive. Original sin is a hard doctrine because if we are infected with an original corruption at the very core of our being, then there's a great deal of evil that cannot be uprooted in this world and life. But with this hard diagnosis comes a powerful cure, a new Adam, Jesus Christ, God and man, who will heal this sin. That's the story of Christianity. And it's, it can, it's very frustrating to think that there is evil in the world, in the human person, that we cannot cure ourselves. And when we try to cure it ourselves completely, we become monstrous. But that doesn't mean we can't try to cure as much as we can, or we become, or we become uncaring. It's this horrible human, we're in this horrible human situation where everything human is always going to be flawed, and yet we're called to our, by our nobility to make everything perfect and godlike. And we'll always end up somewhere in between. There's all sorts of human, that's a human condition. This is explained by Christian anthropology, original sin, and our understanding of creation. That's where we're at. And so we're infected, and the only real ultimate cure is Christ. Questions about that? Questions about original sin and the, you know, the doctrine of original sin and its place in Christian theology and stuff? So we're separated from Eden by original sin. God's plan is to bring back Eden. His plan is to bring back that harmony with us. Um, you know, when we think of heaven, we think in terms of paradise. We don't know what that. We do not know what that means. We do not know what Eden meant in the same way. It doesn't mean it's not real. The human experience, there's an original human experience, I think, that was real. And I think we still get glimpses of it. It's an interesting, an interesting truth, and it may not just be with Christian saints, but and maybe it's with people who are in harmony more than others. But there's a characteristic of some saints that they can communicate with animals. Um, there is a harmony with animals, and this is you know, fairly well documented, uh, a, 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 a harmony with animals that we don't possess, the typical human being doesn't possess. I mean, I, I just think that there, and maybe in your own life, there, there have been hints and times where you kind of glimpse a harmony. Something more, you know, the Catholic Church doesn't believe we're completely destroyed by original sin. This is the difference between Protestant, classic Protestant theology and Catholic theology. Protestant theology say, original sin completely destroyed us. We, there's nothing good left. It's all Christ. And we say, we've been blitzed, bloodied, you know, bombarded, and yet there's still some good in us, too. It's a mixture, which seems, you know, a pride to a Protestant, but, it's in, but again, we say, but that's still our experience. There's nobility still. The, the image and likeness of God, there's still a retention of that somehow. It's still there. Even though there's also these big cracks in us, and we can't perfect ourselves, and we can't save ourselves, and yet there's still this God-like quality in the human person. So it's at both ends. So I'm going to finish. It's, it's 10 to 8, so I'm going to finish the prayer. Thank you for coming. And uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask your blessings upon everyone here, all of us, that we might seek that harmony that we long for, that we can just partially identify and dream about. 
is without identifying perhaps, I, I ask your blessing upon all of us that, that we might find in Christ a cure for what ails us, um, that you might shed your grace upon us, uh, that we might accept that gift, that we might be humble enough to accept uh, a new paradise you planned for us in Christ. So bless all of us with a desire and the, the eventual experience of that harmony. And I ask all these things through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.